guys. So I'm here with Thomas Gartner and Thomas is the director of SC3 Designs and he's based in the UK. And Thomas and I have chatted before about indoor air quality and biophilic design. And he has been gracious enough to speak with me again about paint, a really important subject and um, <clears throat> a subject that we all have so many questions about for those of us that are concerned about health for ourselves, our family <clears throat> and our coworkers. Um, so Thomas, before we get started, I, I have a bunch of questions. We only have 30 minutes, but I just wanted to um, first say hello to you. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure, always a pleasure. And secondly, just something has really been on my mind so much when we're talking about paints. I remember as a kid um, in 1977, which tells you how old I am, because I'm old, um, lead paint was banned and it was huge. It was in the news all over. And they were focusing mostly on poor neighborhoods, how children and babies were chipping the paint off of the walls, eating it, and then later developing mental disabilities, um, cancer, asthma, immune deficiencies. So you're talking that was 43 years ago. That was a long time ago. So we know that this issue with paint and VOCs, which we're gonna talk about has has been around for a long time and it's been hidden, but thank God and thank goodness for people like yourself that educate. I always say education is empowering because it gives you control over making good healthy choices uh, for yourself and the ones you love and the ones you surround yourself with. So having said that, let's talk paint. Um, I think the first question is basically, what is paint? What is in it? What is it? It is paints. There are various different forms of paints and um, they got more and more complex and there are more varieties now, um, which most of them have evolved in sort of last 20, 30 years, really. If you go back to sort of the 1970s, um, up to that point, there were sort of three or four predominant used paint systems and most of them had actually very simple components. The most commonly used one up to that point um, in Europe, but also abroad, was um, something like a lime paint, for example. And this was a very traditional product. It was made of lime. It had the binder that was some cellulose. The lime was there to make things white, essentially. It had sometimes some uh, marble powder added to it for brightness and, um, and some water. And that was it. It was just four that, So nothing in that paint was dangerous. And nothing in there is paint dangerous. This paint has been used in buildings for more than a thousand years. It has been used as whitewash. It has been used to uh, make walls white. It has been used mainly for hygienic reason because lime is, um, has a higher pH value, is antifungal, and also protects from bacteria. So people Could use it on the walls. Could you speak up a little bit louder, Thomas? I'd appreciate Sorry. that. You speak up just a little bit. Yeah. So um, it, um, lime itself is just because of its pH value, because it's slightly alkaline, it's um, antifungal. And so it was used to keep a home hygienic and free of mold, um, essentially. At the same time, of course, cover up walls. And that's what it was used to protect the fabric um, in the olden days. This paint nowadays is still available. The problem is that it is not as forgiving when you apply it. It takes more time. It takes more experience. You need an experienced decorator as well. Um, you need a very good substrate that has to have a certain humidity, moisture content. It's you not say as forgiving. Substrate. Speak, speak in layman's terms when you're speaking. Wall. A, <laughs> a wall or floor or ceiling, for example, where you apply it to. And, um, and so if that substrate, the wall or floor or wall that you apply that, apply that paint to um, is, for example, too wet, if the humidity in the room is too high or too low, if the temperature is not right, then you can't apply a lime paint. Or it so takes... what did they do before 1977 or 1970 when there were only lime paints available? And for example, living here in Miami with the humidity and the mold, what did they do? They would just wait. You would just wait. There's some other paints as well that could be used. There were, for example, casein paint. There were distemper paint. There were generally paints based on natural products. Most of them contained some form of lime in it um, to make things white. Um, they um, sometimes also some uh, marble powder, some calcium, these kind of things. So a mineral generally to make it white. Then they have normally a binder where um, in a lime paint, traditionally, that could be a cellulose binder or the lime itself. You can also have clay paints where the clay is the binder, for example. So you need something to glue the pigments together. 
So that was in the past. They, they that was used in the past natural materials to glue <coughs> to these glue pigments, pigments together, together and to stick them then to the wall. And when the um, <coughs> glue dried off, the pigments adhered to the wall. Paints nowadays work similar in the same way. But nowadays, rather than using natural binders, for example, we use predominantly artificial binders, polyacrylic binders. So these are resin glues, polyacrylic resin glues that we use okay, so to then let's, stick. Let's dummy it down even more to the more mm. layman's terms. So in the past, we used lime, chalk, clay, natural materials. And then after that, we started using things made by man. Yes. And these are additives. For example, there can be up to 150 additives, man-made products and toxins and chemicals in paint that was there to replace, that became easier and cheaper to replace the natural materials that were being used prior, correct? And easier to apply. So um, with the modern paints, you didn't have to wait. You have a polyacrylic binder. That binder doesn't need water or carbon or, or a certain environment to um, um, to, to make the pigment stick right. to the wall. So, so, so the new chemicals that are being put in the paint because life became as fast as we can and as quickly, let's make it, let's let's get it painted fast, it's money. It is. All these chemicals make it easy to apply and easy yeah. to absorb into the air and dry. It is. And even with very little skill and um, with sort of poor, quite high moisture um, walls and substrates that you could find on um, new construction site. If something um, has been newly constructed, you still have quite a bit of moisture and water in the walls and the plaster in the skim coats that you apply in there. In the olden days, you would just wait four to six weeks. On a modern construction site, you can't wait four to six weeks. Um, you have to apply the paint after 10 days or something like that, when the substrate, the walls are still wet from the construction process. A modern paint will forgive that. It will stick anyway because it doesn't need water. It doesn't need carbon or anything to dry out. It will stick to that wall. It is also more forgiving because of the formulation of it, the mixture of it. It will give a relatively even surface, even if the surface below isn't that even. Mm -hmm. And because there are insecticides, pesticides, and fungicides in there, it will also not take sort of damage or show mold. It just nicely covers all these kind of um, pollutes that we'd otherwise find and where the paint could be affected covers that nicely up. So that's what all that modern paint does for you. But so the you modern buy that, makes it easy, yeah. but clearly the health risks are tremendous. It but, is. But before we go into that, I want to first also address paint color, dyes and pigments, because that's part of it. So, so in the new paints, you have them filled with all these additives, all these chemicals, basically Modern paint is just a bunch of chemicals. That's all it is. Prior to that, it was they largely natural. Are. They largely are. And yeah. there's something else that comes to it as well. Hmm. Because they are polyacrylic paints, so that means there's um, a petrochemical binder in there, this resin product in there. What's what a petrochemical? Look? A petrochemical is, um, is um, a um, petroleum-based product. It comes from petrochemical industry rather from a natural product. So it's not sourced. It's produced in a laboratory by mixing chemicals together. Um, and these chemicals then off gas quite often. So right. And these gas. chemicals are very cheap. They are relatively cheap, mm -hmm. um, certainly, certainly cheaper than probably some natural products, but that's mainly to do with the um, large supply network and the demand for these kind of chemicals. In itself, they're not that cheap, actually. If you compare a trade paint with a traditional paint, there's not much between them, in my experience. So then, then it's just the availability of it? It's the availability of it. And of course, that you can apply them easier. It mm -hmm. saves time. So right. contractors, decorators will choose the trade paint, the chemical paint, because it makes their job easier. It doesn't help the um, end user because the end user gets a white wall or a blue right. wall or whatever wall you want. Um, it makes the job easier for the decorator and he doesn't have to live in there, of course. He does, he's not exposed to the chemicals that off gas, right. and he doesn't get the benefit from a wall that might have been painted, for example, in a traditional lime paint. Because what the lime paint also does, because it doesn't have um, a petrochemical or um, um, this, all these chemi uh, chemicals in there, it also lets the um, wall, what we call breathe, so it keeps it permeable. Whereas a modern emulsion paint creates with every layer of paint, a small layer of plastic, if you want, of resin onto your wall. And when it dries down, that creates like a membrane, a plastic membrane with each and every layer. And what this plastic membrane then does, it does not just off gas, it also stops moisture movement in and out of your wall. Right. 
And this is a big, even bigger risk, especially in modern construction, when we make our buildings ever more airtight, ever more energy efficient, which reduces ventilation rates. So that means that moisture within a building is trapped for longer. And that moisture can then also um, result in mold growth. So we're not just introducing the chemicals into our buildings. We also sort of decouple our building structure that could buffer humidity and also help with air quality and take care of itself um, from our living environment. So, that's so in other words, we're creating almost like a bubble around ourselves of, yes. of chemicals and gas that cannot leave, it which is. is why I know that, um, you know, in research, I've learned maybe from you or, or mm -hmm. reading that indoor air quality, which is a whole nother discussion, mm -hmm. which, which paint has a lot to do with besides mm -hmm. the, the, the materials used in the, in the construction, the indoor air quality of the average home or office building nowadays is more toxic than walking in the streets of New York. And that. so that, that in itself, I mean, I'm from New York and let me tell you, you know, I love New York, but it's a dirty <laughs> city, but getting back to paints, let's get mm -hmm. back. Let's talk about dyes a little bit in, in color yeah. and the ethics and the chemicals involved in that. And then we can talk about VOCs and all that off gassing and all those things to explain it and, along with alternatives. So tell me a bit about dyes and pigments in paint. It is pigments. Pigments are challenging as well. Um, because they are usually used in very, very small quantities in paints. Um, they normally don't need to be declared on the tin quite often because they're beyond or below a certain percentage. A paint manufacturer, when they buy it, they, at least in Europe, but I believe in North America, it's the same thing. They have to declare only um, components that are beyond a certain percentage um, within that mix in that paint. And because pigments are relatively low, they quite often don't even have to declare what exactly it is and where it's coming from. So you could have something that is, for example, pure arsenic, but as long as it's within a certain percentage, you don't have to declare it. It is. And, um, and this is true for some of the pigments. Some pigments are um, heavy metal based or metal based or oxide based, for example. And a good example is, for example, also titan dioxide. And titan dioxide is something that makes white. All white paint has it in it. Paper has it in it. It's normally in its bound form. So as long as it's bound with binders and can't get into the air as dust, it's harmless. But since 2017, titan dioxide is um, recognized by the European Union, but also the World Health Organization as carcinogenic. So when it finds its way into the air through, for example, abrasion and something like that, from paint abrasion, for example, or after having spray painted the building, then um, of course, this can find its way into the body through dust, through breathing in, into our system. And the problem with these kind of pigments is because they are metallic dust, our body doesn't get rid of them. They accumulate in our bodies and they typically accumulate in our kidneys and livers. And over a long time by that can then cause liver damage, cancer, um, and also other diseases um, from that as well. Another risk here is also that titan dioxide is more and more used in the form of nanoparticles. So very, very small fine dust particles because it also binds VOCs. So um, it's used you know, as a, your volatile organic compounds. Volatile can, organic compounds. Let, let, let's let's as give an it air a cleanser. Uh -huh. As a cleanser? As a cleanser for air. So um, the titan dioxide. So we get rid of the VOCs with this material, but what we then are exposed to is actually a carcinogenic material in nanoparticle form, which finds its way even into our bloodstream because it's so small when we breathe it in. It doesn't get filtered out in our nose or through our lungs. It goes through into our bloodstream straight through because of the size of these particles. And there, of course, is then another risk with this. And there are other pigments that are still used, which are um, some of them heavy metals still. And lead, of course, we don't use that anymore. But other heavy metals are still used in paints, varnishes, but also some finishes and treatments for fabrics, timber, um, wood finishes that are then used, for example, as fire protection treatments on fabrics, on finishes, wood finishes, as insecticides. You know, listening, to you, listening to you speak reminds me of, you know, when you, um, how there's been so much, so much awareness about plastic straws, which is great. For, for the world, for marine life. But it's, it's, it's almost a joke compared to cruise ships dumping. I mean, it's, it's like you're fixing one small problem, which is great about the plastic straws, but there's so much more out there. So people are becoming aware about low VOCs, but then they're not aware of this other chemical. Yes, so yes. it's like, it, it's so overwhelming. So one thing replaces another really. 
it is. And it's actually very simple because these traditional paints, they still exist. And even these products, these traditional lime paint products have evolved over the last um, decades. Um, there's a growing market for people who are more concerned about it, who want to minimize the impact from these products. And the easiest way is to use less different components or petrochemicals and focus on materials that we know they work for us as humans. They don't cause health issues because they've been used for hundreds of years and they're very simple products as well. They're, for example, modern lime paints, which um, are just manufactured um, in a different way. They are mixed at higher speeds, so the lime particles are more dispersed and they are applied like an emulsion paint. They stick much better to a wall, very similar to an emulsion paint. They don't need that much skill as you would with a traditional lime product. I can apply them and I'm not an expert on these kinds of things. So the reason, the reason that they're not being marketed so much is? Smaller manufacturers. Mm -hmm. They're generally smaller ecological manufacturers. Um, they, um, of course, use less products. There's less of a market for the petrochemical industry um, in these um, as well. So, um, and um, their supply network is smaller, of course. And, and let's talk about the ethics behind pigments and dyes. Yeah, so um, in terms of ethics with pigment and dyes is also that quite often one finds where they're of course coming from. With pigments and dyes, there's also the element of um, animal testing, of course, which is um, a big issue around there. And even if you know what kind of pigments and dyes are used within a paint product, you can't trace it back. You don't know um, what and how these pigments have been evolved and developed by these companies, for example. Has animal testing um, been in place? The same you find also, of course, with, um, um, with, with, with other fabric dyes and so on, not just paint products as well. You can still rely on natural pigments and natural dyes. So, um, so they are still available, of course, typically in smaller quantities. And there are, again, some ecological paint manufacturers, um, at least down here um, in, the, um, in the UK and um, in Europe, that, are, that have become more and more popular. Um, and they are nowadays quite sizable. And they, for example, um, have a commitment to ethical production they make sure that none of the pigments um, or dyes they use have been tested on animals, that they use traditional products that don't need testing because they've been used for so long. So they don't fall under um, product development or chemical regulations that you have to test for cancer, um, for example, in these dyes. The downside is because they're traditional natural dyes, they quite often don't have these vibrant colors. And that is quite often true um, and where one has to compromise a little bit. Um, with these yes, most yes, yes, I understand that. And I know that just from, as a designer, trying to seek uh, different colors. But to me, it's also about convincing the client that, you know, yeah. there's other ways to add pops of color in, in places. Um, so let's, well, we have a couple minutes left. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about, you know, we're talking about natural paints, which are great. And when we're done with this, I'm going to um, give everyone a link to some natural paints. Low VOC paint. So if let's say we, we have a client who said, you know, or someone wants to paint their nursery or their bedroom said, you know what, I don't like these duller colors that are available in the lime paints. I would like to do something a little brighter or stronger. What about a low VOC paint? We and typically can you explain in these... VOC for people that don't know out there what volatile, it stands for volatile yes. organic compounds. It is. So it's, it's volatile organic compounds. And what that means, it's, it's, um, it's, a chemical compound, an organic chemical compound, um, which, is, um, which can be some form of um, petrochemical, but it could also be um, natural products. For example, if you have, um, it's any form of sort of typically organic resin type that um, at room temperature, 20 degrees, will um, um, turn into gas and, um, and of course find its way into the air and we breathe it in. You have, for example, also onions, we have oranges and um, lime oils and these kind of things, linseed, for example, the smell of that, they all are quite high in VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Right, but, those are, but those, are, are the, those are considered safe VOCs, yes. correct? Because they're plant-based. The and difference the between the two is, is that mm -hmm. a natural VOC typically breaks down quicker and is at lower concentration, whereas a petrochemical VOC typically um, doesn't break down that easily. It's designed to maintain its sort so of. So when we also say petrochemical, that's also I think it's called anthropogenic, right? Mm -hmm. Which are man-made VOCs. Yeah. So that's yeah. those are the VOCs we're talking about that are made in paints and glues and adhesives yes. and perfumes and cleaning products, and yeah. they're in a 
they're in a range of household and office products that we don't even realize. No, um, and they are much more complex and quite often also at that concentration carcinogenic. You can also find that in um, research studies where they um, tested rooms for four to six weeks and they found that in the first week the VOC levels would drop down after painting that room. But then they found that actually it stays fairly constant and typically at five to six times the level of um, the World Health Org Re Organization's recommendation. Um, and even then, when everyone expects at some point they will drop off because you ventilated away, they even found that they will not only just stay on that level, they quite often go up again because the VOCs from the layers below come through and maintain right. that sort of flows VOC in that space. And, and they're also they, mixing with all the other chemicals within yeah. that environment and creating just a stronger it, storm in a way, correct? It is. So that's exactly. And that's when natural materials generally are lower in VOCs and they don't last as long. So this off-gassing will reduce over time. If you are sensitive and allergic and, um, to some of these VOCs, for example, timber, resins, or also linseed, which is used in some paints, for example, then of course, these are not products for you as well. We typically recommend if somebody is susceptible to VOCs um, and these chemicals and wants to avoid them, we quite often use silicate paint. They also nowadays come in um, quite wide range of colors, quite vibrant colors as well. They are similar to lime paints in that they're also antifungal just by the pH value. They are permeable, fully permeable. They let the um, building structure to dry out. They don't trap any moisture. You can't apply them to wallpaper. You need a um, mineral substrate like a gypsum plaster, a skim, a lime plaster or something like that. Wait, so the silicone paints are... In so you can decide on, let's say, a lime-based paint and a silicon paint? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. And are silicon paints more readily available or not? Yes. The yeah. They come from big manufacturers as well. They are traditionally were used in them um, as external masonry paints and then found their way through bathroom paints and internal bedroom paints. And they're, they're not also, toxic? They're not toxic. They, um, they are based on, um, again, mainly mineral contents. So we quite often have um, either a lime um, product in there, for example, or some marble powder as, um, as something that makes it white. The binder is essentially molten quartz, the same um, basic um, product that's used for making glass, if you want, um, and that's turned into a liquid. So um, why, wouldn't a why wouldn't a manufacturer, if now everyone's promoting, or Benjamin Moore, or Bayer, Sherwin-Williams, they're all promoting low VOC paints, why don't they promote a silicon paint? Um, it's, it's a different paint and the paint itself is slightly more expensive, but mm -hmm. you only need, for example, where you would with an emulsion paint, typically use three coats to get the proper um, coverage. Um, when you say surface, emulsion paint? With a traditional emulsion paint, which okay. is the um, sort of traditional trade paint um, here. Um, with a um, silicate paint, for example, you would only use two coats. But again, you need a, um, a mineral substrate, so it has to go onto a... Um, um, plastered wall directly, for example. So in a new build, that's relatively straightforward. It's a little so bit more expensive. So could that be applied on drywall? Yeah. So we can. Yeah. So um, so we applied that on drywalls as well, and um, and that works well. It's um it's a very lasting paint. It's a bit more expensive in terms of the material per square meter, but it's not hugely, because in our experience, the main cost is in the labor anyway. Right. So the decorator putting it on. So ideally, in the the pecking order of ideal to okay, would be lime paint would be ideal, silicone paint would be ideal. Yeah. And then if that fails and you really are not happy with, with either of those two, then low VOC, correct? Yes, so there are some low VOC paints that you can also use. The problem with the low VOC is, although they're low VOC, they still create this plastic membrane on your wall if it is an emulsion paint. So you still, slowly but surely with every layer of decoration that you put on there over the years, create your own plastic bag that you live in. And, and that is the thing which is becoming more and more of a problem as well. Whereas, right. um, and this is then um, issues around mold condensation, especially in better performing higher, lower energy buildings. So the paints that we use in our buildings, we focus generally, first of all, that we have a permeable paint. So we don't trap moisture. We let the um, building structure um, to dry out behind it and that it can regulate moisture. We then look at that we have 
a no VOC point paint, ideally a mineral paint that can be a lime paint, which is trickier to um, install. If we work on commercial projects, that is, for example, residential schemes with, with several units, 10, 15, 40 units, we typically would go for something that is might be a bit more expensive on the material, but is more foolproof and easier to install, and that would be the silicate paint. That right, goes on exactly, the wall. because in the long run, then you're like, not going to have to worry about mold and... No. Exactly. And you have no problem with the application. It goes on like an emulsion paint. The decorator won't notice the difference between the two really, apart from then it's a bit more expensive. But he only needs the two coats on it. That can also go onto a wet wall. The wall behind it will dry out. You will not have anything trapped in there. If they apply it too early in the process, it doesn't harm that much. You will still get to get finish in there once the wall is dry behind it. Um, in I have one, one more question, but it's like a couple, we only have like two minutes left. Mm. Can you tell us about latex paint versus satin versus flat? What are the differences and is there an ideal? Latex um, versus non-latex and the different finishes. Yeah, so the differences between them is, um, is exactly this vapor permeability. So the latex paint is, um, is scrubbable and you can wipe it off more easily because it, it creates this sort of smooth finish. Um, at the same time, that smooth finish is created by that resin. So what you do, you, you exactly sort of cover off all the, of the wall. You create this plastic layer on the top of it. Now, the problem with latex paint is that over time, it still cracks open. It still gets fine cracks in it, very, very fine ones. And in there, you get the moisture. But when the moisture gets behind it, it can't dry out because you have this membrane behind it. And sort of it can just locally, wherever you have that crack in there, but because you have a substrate behind that moves moisture, it will trap it in the wall somewhere. And that's why, for example, um, at least here in Europe, we don't use latex paint at all anymore. Satin is, um, is a bit of a mix between the latex and the, um, and the flat, that is um, the matte paint, and, um, and is, has a higher resistance to moisture movement, whereas the matte one is, um, is the lower one on them. If you have to go for an emulsion, I would always recommend go for a matte one you still get some permeability in there. It's not as bad. If you have the satin one, even two layers of paint will stop moisture movement. The latex one, quite often, one layer is enough. And that's the same as a, as a polyester membrane, a plastic bag that you right, also so get. So you shouldn't solid. be using latex and you no. shouldn't be using satin. You should. And so, so, do, so the lime paints and the silicone paints don't even come, they're not latex. They're... No, no. no. They're, okay. they're generally matte. So um, lime paint in itself is, again, it has quite a traditional finish. It's almost like a milky and it feels yeah. almost sort of like translucent. It has some depth in it. If you like that sort of thing, they're really it's appealing. It's a beautiful if, look. It's a beautiful it, it look. It is. I, I personally really do like it. It also brings the um, structure behind it sort of a bit more out there. And I really yeah. like that effect. But some people who want this really clean, modern, crisp, clear cut surfaces, lime paint might not be the right thing. But here, silicate paints, work well, I believe. Um, and that's what we're quite often using. In the past, we also used casein paints. They um, is a very traditional paint that uses um, milk protein as a binder. You nowadays also get it as a vegetable protein, which is made of pea protein. Um, so it's a completely vegan paint as well. That What's one is called? again, it's, um, it's, um, it's a casein paint. Yeah. Um, but um, they are again, a very traditional paint. They give them, um, they apply it like an emulsion paint. They give a very similar feel and look of an emulsion paint, but um, because of the um, protein in there, they're more susceptible to mold. If you have slightly damp walls or slight damp issues or a new build construction, um, I would recommend them nowadays anymore. You need a completely dry wall to put them right, on. Right, because also because, and the last point is, it's, it's hard to find a good vegan paint. Yes. So even the lime paint and the silicone paint are not vegan, correct? Because they contain casein, is that it? Um, not necessarily. So um, the casein, yes, some of the casein paints contain milk protein. So that's right. Nowadays you get them with the vegetable casein um, that is made from pea or beans. The lime paint comes with two things. You can have um, a milk protein as a binder in there sometimes, but there's also when there are pit lime paints that use some um, uh, cellulose as a binder. So methyl cellulose, uh, cellulose which is, is beach. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. beach cellulose um, from the tree that's used in there. So um, it's a purely mineral and plant-based product. Um, and um, I can recommend some manufacturers, three or four, um, who, who are quite open about yes, the Yes, yes, if you can send it to me after um, I'll post it. And, um, and they are also certainly available here in Europe, UK, Germany, but they will also, I believe, ship abroad.
Um, so um, they also, these kind of manufacturers, they offer the um, individual components. So you can also mix your paint yourself, choose your own pigments to add to it if you're concerned about that. Ah, and with that kind of approach, you can also mix and match certain components. So for example, if you don't want to use their binder, you can use an alternative cellulose binder. So you can, you can replace certain right, components. Right, you can replace this. You can get a basic white systems. and then add your own pigment. It is. Um, and, um, and that helps as well. And, and you still get good quality products in there. So um, that's also what we've done for quite a few of our clients. We're very concerned about health and certain aspects of materials and that put them into a position where they're more um, in control of these elements. Um, Terrific. So you know what, Thomas, um, we're going to have to finish, but Thomas, I'm going to, after this, I'm going to send everyone an email and post it about how to get in touch with Thomas and his wonderful architectural firm. And Thomas is going to give us um, a couple names of brands. And also Thomas, maybe you'll just write down also that little recipe you just gave for yep. making your own. Okay? I will do. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Great. Take care. Thank you.